As you're being seated, I invite you to take your Bible and turn to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. I hope that all of us bring a great, great sense of excitement and anticipation to the hearing of God's Word today. Today we, we wrap up our series on the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. These are in so many ways foundational chapters for the rest of what we find in the Bible. We've entitled the sermon series uh, during the month of June. We've entitled it First Things, or as I've called it, Bible 101. Because here in the opening chapters of Genesis, we learn how God views reality, how God views nature, our nature, and the nature of all creation. And we finish today as we look at the results of the fall of the human race into sin and rebellion. In chapter 1, we saw that God created all of creation, including humanity and the animals, and deemed them to be good and very good. But then something happens in chapter 3. You can't read chapters 1 and into chapter 2 without reading chapter 3. In chapter 3, as we saw last week, the human, the human original parents chose both rebellion and disobedience. And our text for the morning begins in verse 14, where we hear God judging the serpent and the woman and the man, and then we see how, how the story ends. Again, foundational chapters for the rest of the Bible. So beginning at verse 14, chapter 3, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman... He said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. My friends, this is the Word of God. Would you pray with me? God, we pray that you'll give each one of us the grace to invite you to interfere with our lives. We pray, God, that you will disrupt, interrupt our lives, invade our lives with your Spirit. Do whatever is necessary, God, in our lives to help us be the people you have created us to be, to be the people that you have recreated us to be, 
in Jesus Christ. Help us to grow up into the full measure of maturity in the image of Christ. Give each one of us ears to hear what your word is saying to us today. Amen. Of course, John Steinbeck's Magnus Opum was the novel that he produced in the 1950s entitled East of Eden. It's a story of two families, the Trask and the Hamiltons. You read that great novel, East of Eden, and you see how their lives were filled with love, freedom, and human charity. But the book most powerfully, most powerfully shows that their lives were filled with the capacity for human depravity and for self-destruction and guilt. When we read John Steinbeck's East of Eden, for those of us who love and have been immersed in the Bible, we know why John Steinbeck called that book East of Eden. Today, in this world, in this age, post-Genesis 3, we are all living East of Eden. And we need to know what that means for us, what that means for the world around us. Again, think back over chapters 1 and 2 into chapter 3. God created all, and he deemed it good. He deemed it very good. Then God created. You get a, you get a subsection where he shows you more closely what happened on day 6, and you see the creation of man and woman. You see the institution of marriage created. You see that life is good there in paradise in the Garden of Eden. And then you turn to chapter 3. And all of a sudden in chapter 3, there's a serpent there in the garden in paradise. Now, if you read the New Testament, the New Testament tells you, John tells us in the New Testament, that serpent is Satan. And that's why the serpent tempts Eve and Adam, our original parents, our first parents, the progenitors of the human race, there in the book of Genesis. Our original parents, there in the garden, under the prompting from the serpent, they chose to seek self-autonomy. They chose to seek what they thought was best for them. They chose to become more like gods in their own eyes, more like captains of their own destiny. You know the story, historically we call it the fall. You see that in Genesis chapter 3. You see how in Genesis chapter 3, because of the rebellion and the disobedience of our original parents, we, we become a rebellious, disobedient, buck-passing kind of creature. And that's what we have passed down through the human family throughout all the ages. There's chapter 1 of Genesis, chapter 2 of Genesis, but then chapter 3 of Genesis happens. And at the end of chapter 3, you see our original parents cast out of Eden. They are sent to the east of Eden. We are living east of Eden. That's the point of the biblical story. That's the point of the narrative from Genesis through Revelation. There was a time in the original creation, in the original goodness, when God did look at creation and say, it is good, it is even very good. But that's not where we're dwelling now. We're dwelling east of Eden now. We've been cast out of the full presence of God. He no longer walks with us in great, great intimacy in the cool of the evening as he did there in the book of Genesis. We have to struggle to seek the presence of God now in this land east of Eden. That's who we are. That's where we are. That's how God defines reality. Sometimes we define reality in other ways, but that's how God defines reality. We end the text with those original humans being cast out of the garden. Paradise was lost, according to John Milton, and now we are in this 
predicament. In the text I read a few moments ago, you see how after the fall, God judged, cursed even if you will, the serpent, the woman, and the man. To the serpent, the serpent was turned into the snake that we all know and was cursed to crawl on the ground, eating dust all of its life. To the woman, you see that the judgment involved that from this point on, there would be pain in childbearing. From this point on, there would be rivalry and antagonism in the relationship between husband and wife. And the judgment upon the man, you see how the man was judged. The man was judged in such a way that all of his toil, all of his work throughout human history would produce the sweat of his brow and that earth would not always cooperate because nature has fallen too now. Earth will not always cooperate with us as we seek to make a living here on this earth. There will be thorns and thistles, and when it ends, we, we die. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return. As a result of the fall, as a result of Genesis 3, death and decay has entered human nature. Death and decay has entered all of creation. Without human nature being acted upon from the outside, without creation being acted upon from the outside, really without everything being acted upon from the outside, everything decays. Everything descends into chaos and work needs to be done. And sometimes the work is hard to be done to help find the life in this world that we want to have. And then chapter 3 draws to a close. You've read it. Some of you have been reading it since you were in Sunday school. You've read it. I, I hope that we pay close attention because these are foundational texts for the rest of Scripture. You heard how it closed. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. There's a connection in the Hebrew between the word Eve and living. And then look at verse 21. I particularly want you to see verse 21. You've heard it maybe many times, but did you really hear it? Verse 21, And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. We're given the picture of reality here in this text. You're given the picture of fallen creation, fallen humanity, but I hope also you catch the picture of God that's presented in this text. The most important thing we could ever learn, certainly the most important thing we could ever learn from Scripture, is the character of God, who God is. I hope that you noticed here in Genesis 3, as soon as the fall occurred, God spoke the prophecy. We looked at it last week in some detail. God spoke the prophecy. We call it the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first prophecy, the first prediction of the one who is to come to redeem us out of this mess. You heard what God said to the serpent. He will strike your head. He he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And the Christian church, as we've read this now for 2,000 years, we see that and we say, that's a picture of Calvary. There's the Son of God, our Redeemer. There on the cross, the serpent is striking his heel, is bruising him, is hurting him. But really what you're watching is you're watching the Redeemer strike the head crush the head with a death-dealing blow to the serpent. So as soon as the fall occurs, you begin hearing and seeing, I hope experiencing, the grace of God being presented here. You see God's great love. You notice even after they fell into disobedience and rebellion, God came looking for them. God took the initiative, came looking for them in the garden, and he said, Adam, where are you? Really, he was saying, Adam, why are you hiding? He pulled the original couple out of hiding so that he could speak words both of judgment and promise to the original couple. There will come one who will strike the head of the serpent. The first 
the first proclamation of the gospel. And then you heard just a few moments ago in verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife, and he clothed clothed them. So you're watching God love unconditionally. You're watching God come in great grace to this rebellious couple. You notice how God does the work of covering their shame. God does the work of covering their brokenness. But did you notice how he did it? The text says, Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife. Some animals had to die. Some blood had to be shed. I hope you're connecting the dots and beginning to connect the dots. Some blood had to be shed. That's the way God, for whatever reason in God's sovereignty, that's the way God began to cover, cover the shame and the guilt of these original humans. Some animals had to die, and God used the, the bloodshed of those animals to cover their brokenness. I hope, again, your mind, like your mind did in verse 15, I hope your mind is wandering toward, toward Golgotha and Calvary at this point. I hope you're catching on to what this text is telling us about the character of God, God's grace. So here at the beginning, God decided that blood is a means of redemption. That's why throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, throughout the rest of what we call the Old Testament, they're making animal sacrifices in the tabernacle and the temple. They're making animal sacrifices to atone for the sin of the human race. But then eventually will come that final sacrifice, that once and for all perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who sheds his blood to take away the sin of the world. That's the whole narrative of the Bible. You see how the story starts. You already know how the story progresses. That's what we have here in this text. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us. We've already talked about how in chapter 1 we think we get a hint or a glimpse of the Trinity. See, the man has become like one of us. See the plural knowing good and evil, they did learn something. They did come to know something, our original parents. They come to understand and know their brokenness and their shame and their guilt. Became like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's a, that's, that's a concern of God's at this point. But now that they have fallen, they may go eat from that tree of life and live forever. Before the fall, they could have continued to eat from the tree of life, and they would have been immortal, but God doesn't want them to be immortal at this point. And we think we know the reason. Who would want to live forever on, on this side of paradise? Who would want to live forever east of Eden? Who would want to live forever in the brokenness and the shame and the guilt and the trials and the tribulations of what it means to be human? Fallen people in a fallen creation. Who would want to live forever? So out of God's great grace and God's mercy, he prevents access to the tree of life. Because he knows we don't want to live forever in this state, in this place. So he wants to prevent access to the original parents, to this tree of life. And the text ends, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. We have been chased out of the garden. We've been banished by by God from the garden. Paradise has been lost. We have been banished, and the cherubim, those mighty angels, are standing to keep us out of the Garden of Eden, and their swords are zigzagging as they display to us that we are not allowed access back into the Garden of Eden, and we end the story cast out of the garden away from the tree of life, and then you read the rest of Genesis. You read the rest 
of the Bible. You notice as you turn to chapter 4, you remember what happens. Cain kills Abel. Sin alienates us from each other, just like sin alienates us from God. We are in a predicament. We are east of Eden now, and we know that. You know that. There have been more mass shootings this year than there have been days of the year. I've been told, I've read, there are 27 wars going on right now on planet Earth. And that's been typical of human history. We tend to pay attention to the conflict between Ukraine and Russia and what's going on in those places. But there are 27 wars going on right now on planet Earth. Hope you understand we are east of Eden at this point. Think about the brokenness of creation with, with the terrible natural disasters that we live with here on planet Earth. We are not in Eden anymore, Toto. We are east of Eden. We need someone to come and crush the hill, crush the head of the serpent. We need a deliverer. We need a redeemer. We need someone that can salvage our situation. We need someone that can take the mess we've created and take the people who make the messes and redeem and make it all okay. Turn everything to right. That's the rest of the Bible. You go into the story of Cain and Abel, you see the rest of the book of Genesis. You begin to see how the Israelite, the people of God, the chosen people of God, for a few moments, they will be faithful, then they fall away. God sends prophets, they come back, and they repeat the cycle. But then comes Jesus. We have a very interesting concept in Christian theology, and um, even though you may not have heard the concept according to its Latin title, I think you will resonate with the theological concept. In the Christian community, we have a theological concept called Felix Culpa. You translate that Latin into happy fall or happy fault. Because now that we've looked at this for thousands of years, we look at the fall and we say there's a good side to the fall and that's why we call it the Felix Culpa the happy fall the happy fault and we know that because we know the character of God God is a God who is always bringing good out of evil he takes the messes we make and brings something beautiful out of them it was Ambrose then it was Augustine, and throughout history we've talked about the Felix Culpa. And what we mean by that is this. What we lost in Genesis 3 pales in comparison to what we will receive in Christ. The journey will be worth it. One day, because we are banished from the garden and we don't have access to the tree of life one day we will die one day we'll be part of the eternal kingdom now that we've looked at the first few chapters of the bible let me remind you of the second or the last two chapters of the last book of the bible let me remind you what you read in revelation 22 because the Bible is put together in a very specific way. We've been cast out of the garden. We have been denied access to the tree of life. And then you turn, you make your way through the story. You make your way through human history. And then in Revelation 22, the last book of the Bible, we read this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal. You know, when we talk about gathering at the river, when we sing that hymn, we're talking about this river, the river of life, the one in the eternal kingdom, the river of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice the Lamb is enthroned there with God through the middle of the street of that city. On either side of the river is the, here it is, church fans, tree of life. On either side of the river is the tree of life. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. In Christ, we are going to gain more than we ever lost because of our first humans, because of being a human 
We're going to gain more in Christ than we can ever imagine. We're going to receive access back to the tree of life there in the eternal kingdom. We'll be there by the water that flows from the throne of God. And we will have, we will have a garden of Eden on steroids when we finally get there. That's what we're being offered in Jesus Christ. It's not being offered any other way. Blood was shed, a lot of blood was shed, then his blood was shed. And that makes atonement for our sin and our brokenness and our shame and our guilt. Through him, the one who is the way, through him, we will one day not be living east of Eden. Amen.